Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of our new podcast, For the Love of Reading, sponsored by Highlights for Children. I'm Christine French Cully, your podcast host, and I am so glad that you are here. At this moment, we are still sheltering at home and practicing social distancing. Schools are still closed and children are still at home. It is a challenging time in so many ways. To the parents who are listening, who have suddenly found yourselves teaching at home, I hope you're finding your sea legs in your new role. You and your children were top of mind for us as we planned this new episode. You know, at Highlights, we are beginning to receive letters from kids who say they are bored at home, and they are also sharing with us their thoughts, their confusion and fear related to the coronavirus. When we write these kids back and we answer every letter and email we receive from children, we offer many suggestions of things they could do to both help keep them busy and help them manage their anxiety. And one of our suggestions is that they use this time at home to read more often. Now, I know this is preaching to the choir, but reading can be both fun and therapeutic. And our guest today, Jennifer Miller, is going to help us understand that idea better. Jennifer is the founder of the very helpful website, Confident Parents, Confident Kids, and author of a book by the same name. She is a contributor to NBC's Parenting Toolkit, and these are just a few of her many accomplishments. She has, after all, more than 20 years of experience coaching parents and working with educators in an effort to help boost kids' social-emotional development. Jennifer is going to talk to us today about how reading and storytelling can help our kids deal with their anxieties related to these uncertain times, deal with them in a way that both helps them cope on a personal level and helps them develop empathy. So thank you, Jennifer, for giving us your time. We're so glad you're here. Welcome. Thank you. What a treat it is to talk with you and work with you again. I love the resources that Highlights are providing particularly in this unique time so that children have materials to read and puzzles to do and activities to play with. So I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, we really have worked to provide some free resources for parents. And parents, if you haven't found them yet, uh, you can visit us on our social media sites to find the links. Uh, We really do see parents who are struggling and, and we want to help in every way we can. So I I think our conversation with you today is also going to be of great benefit to parents who want to make sure that this time home with their children is as productive as it can possibly be. So Jennifer, your specialty is the social emotional development of children. And you are a mom. Also, you have a child at home. Can you talk a little bit to start us off about the kinds of fears and anxieties kids might be experiencing right now in this new normal? (laughs) Yeah, it is interesting. I think children are uh, have this as as we all do this general under the skin sense of worry, and I think because there's so much uncertainty about leaving home, about going out in public, uh, there is this general worry about we don't know, we really don't understand the threat. We don't understand how long it's going to last. We don't understand how uh, staying at home is going to go with with homeschool or schooling at home. And so there are so many unknowns that adults and children face. Um, So I think they have uh, this constant sense, low-level worry in them about their own uncertainties. But I would also add to that, that they are watching the adults in their family and we are stressed and fearful and anxious and taking in all the news and information that is out there. uh, And there's so much that we don't know. So I think they have yet another layer of fear that comes from seeing mom and dad and grandma and grandpa looking nervous, uh, maybe more on edge than usual, and not really understanding or being able to unpack it all. There's just this mysterious set of germs, these invisible germs that are are serving as a threat to our to everyone. 
including people that we don't see around the world. So there, it seems like there's layers of, of worry and fear. Mm -hmm. Well, I think often kids don't know how to talk to their parents about their concerns and parents don't always know how to begin the conversation with their children. Reading together, choosing the right reading material can be a great way to open up important conversations. I agree. And I think um, particularly uh, it's true for fiction, but it can be true for nonfiction as well. Usually when you dive into fiction, there is danger, there is peril, there is conflict, there is fear. And so fiction is wonderful because no matter what story you pick, if your child is interested in it and intrigued by it, then they have the opportunity to face their fears by empathizing deeply with the character who's needing to face danger. And they're getting to face it in a safe way. It opens up a conversation for you and your child if you're reading together. And it's a, a really safe way to talk about fears. So I think what I hear you saying is you can choose a story that has all those attributes and you don't have to specifically address their fears about the coronavirus. Just, just the act of reading about a protagonist's uh, own journey on a, on a fraught path can be helpful to your children in this time. Is, is that what you're saying? That is absolutely what I'm saying. The, the connection that you create when you're reading with your child is important and creates uh, a shared love of reading and a shared bond in that moment. Uh, but then also it opens the opportunity for safe conversation about fears and worries that you might not have if you're just staring eyeball to eyeball at the dinner table. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And is this true of both preschoolers and school age children? Absolutely, yes. Equally important at preschool age and elementary age. And I would say uh, one thing that we can do to address anxiety in our family life and household is to create consistent routines that really creates psychological safety for our children. They know what to expect. They know what's coming next. They can count on it. And I encourage families to think about love and connection as part of that routine. Are we going to get a hug in? Are we going to get uh, some connecting time as part of those routines? But what about having a daily reading routine? Uh, whether it happens at bedtime or maybe it happens during breakfast, having that regular time to read together offers all those benefits of anticipating loving connections, opening up great dialogue, empathizing with characters about their fears and being able to explore their own fears during that time. Mm -hmm. So many times parents say they wish they'd had time to establish those kinds of routines in their, in their family day-to-day um, -day activities. And now here we are, we have the time. It's just one of the most valuable things parents can do for their kids. Absolutely. I agree. So talk a little bit about nonfiction. If you have a kid who really isn't into fiction, uh, how can nonfiction help quell some of your children's fears and anxieties during this time? I think biographies can be really incredible. Uh, the, the Who Is book series, I don't know if you're familiar with the Who Is book series, but it's their, uh, their first chapter books. And they cover a really wide range of famous individuals, uh, whether it's Rosa Parks or we, uh, we read one on Blackbeard, the pirate. Uh, but what happens when you read about individual true stories about individuals' lives is they all faced 
trials. They all faced adversity. And so you get to learn about how they faced adversity. And sometimes, like in the case of Blackbeard, it wasn't healthy. They made, he made awful choices. And you can talk about that. And then there are other characters that are individuals that made healthy choices. And you can talk about the outcomes of that. But, uh, but regardless of who you're learning about or who your child's interested in learning about, you can experience, empathize with the fears that they had to cope with when they were up against major trials. Sometimes it often offers perspective too, that this is usually trials like these, like COVID-19, are time limited that we have been through pandemics in history before, and our grandmothers' grandmothers have have endured, and uh, and there's an opportunity here to build resilience in our children and understand that they can be strong during this this time of uncertainty. Yes, build resilience and offer hope. I think it's yeah. so important. And that's one of the things literature can do is remind our children that um, we are resilient as a, as a species <laughs> and there is hope. Tomorrow will be a better day. So uh, also talk a little bit about storytelling in general. I mean, essentially what you're saying is, is learning the stories of others, people who have been faced with obstacles or setbacks or losses and they've overcome them. That's a great way to help ally your children's fears and um, help them build grit and uh, perseverance and see that they too will emerge on the other side strong and, and just fine, even maybe better for it all. Um, so it's, it's story. It's about story, right? And, and we don't always have to share story in a, in a printed and bound book. Right. Absolutely. I think family storytelling can be really powerful. Uh, I think telling the story of children's resilience in the past, even if it's small, remember when you were struggling to learn to ride a bike and you gassed your knee and it was really tough and it took a while, but after after a time of tr getting back on and practicing you just flew down the street, you know, so telling those stories where your child has faced fears before, maybe they were uncertain, maybe it was their first day of preschool or their first day of kindergarten, and you can take them back mentally to how scared they were and how much they didn't know about their teachers and other students and how they learned that they they grew to love their teacher, they grew to love the other students. There can be some magic to this time. Even though we are under a lot of pressure and stress, the world has slowed us down. All of a sudden, we're being forced to hang at home and be with our families, and there can be real magic and treasure in that. So I think if we're we're producing those stories as a family, it helps with that kind of perspective. Oh yeah, we've been through hard times before. We know what it's like. We know that we can get through the pain. We can support one another, and we'll be okay. You know. Yeah, I love that. Uh, there's a lot to be learned by helping children. There's a lot to be learned from all of us looking back at um, past. Uh, challenges and remembering what we did to overcome them. And, you know, I think it's an interesting time, too, for parents to share the stories of their parents and people who've come before us. Uh, because, I agree. I agree. Uh, kids are interested in, in family stories and the stories of their parents and their grandparents and, and their great-grandparents. And there's so much... Um, history there and so much, so many lessons in the history that we can share with our kids. Yes. In fact, I was thinking uh, sharing ancestors stories is really critical. I, I noticed uh, an article in the New York Times on two grandmothers who were talking about living through the Spanish flu and how they yes. endured that. 
Uh, so I think those stories can be really powerful. I was always also thinking I have a 12 year old and this might just be the moment for us to read the diary of Anne Frank together uh, and understand how she dealt with being isolated uh, for a considerable amount of time in just a part of a house during the Holocaust. So there are lots of interesting historical accounts that we can we can share with our children to better understand how people have coped with the times and and thrived through tough times. That book in particular is a really relevant book for these times. I was in Amsterdam in November and I toured the Anne Frank House and I've been thinking a lot about that experience these last few weeks. They were sequestered there for a very long time in conditions far harsher than uh, what most of us are experiencing today. And we can draw a lot of inspiration and motivation from her story. Yes. Yes, I love that. What else would you tell parents about how to use books and story to help their kids grapple with difficult emotions? Well, I, th- I think I would underscore difficult emotions uh, in your question that we struggle uh, as adults to talk about emotions that challenge us. And uh, we may tend to shut down those kinds of conversations. We, we were in a conversation the other night at dinner about horror movies. And all of a sudden, my husband and I looked at each other and said, oh, no, he's going to have nightmares. We've got to stop talking about this. And we took a pause and we realized, you know what, we're talking about fear. And this is exactly what we should be talking about. So I think that reading can introduce subjects that we're not used to discussing Uh, that can make us uncomfortable, and that's a good thing. And uh, so I think just paying attention to the feelings of characters when you're reading with your child, asking your child the question, what do you think this character is feeling right now, particularly when they're facing the climax or the, the big conflict of the story, so that your child grows in their self-awareness. They're able to name their emotions, even if they're difficult ones, and also normalize it. It's okay to be fearful. We are all feeling that way, and it is really normal. And so then if we're feeling that way, what, what can we do with it? And it, it really offers that chance to just normalize what we're feeling. And honestly, that's half the battle uh, is being able to name it, to tame it, to put it out there and, and say, it's OK that we're feeling this way and we're going to support each other through this. Yes, I love that name it to tame it. I mean, you do have to admit the fear is there or admit whatever the emotion is you're feeling in order to heal it. Uh, it's so important. Exactly. And it, it's exactly. not you just it's not a good idea to sweep it under the rug uh, as tempting as it may be, because right now, I mean, we are all dealing, as you say, with our own uh, overload of um, concern over these uncertain times. But I you know, there's a lot of science to support the idea that you can fake it till you make it. <laughs> so even right. if I think we I adults feel- aren't feeling particularly hopeful or confident if we um, exude the, the idea that we, we do or we are fine and hopeful, um, we begin to feel more hopeful and more fine. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think the place to limit is in our intake of news stories during the day because we, we do need information, but uh, information can go on overload and we can create more anxiety when we're seeing so many news stories that are scaring us and then in turn scaring our children. So I think limiting that and upping the conversations on how we're feeling can really make a difference in children's experience. That's good advice. So one of the emotions parents and children both are feeling is uh, isolation. Even though we're all together in the same rooms, sometimes 
uh, we miss we miss the the social connection that we have outside of the family. And even I think sometimes when you're together, you can feel a little bit alone. Reading together is one way to bring everybody closer. And as you say, storytelling also. But can you expand a little more on the idea that storytelling is a is a special way of helping bring families closer together and helping families feel less isolated? Yeah, that's such an important point. I think just cuddling up next to one another with a good book, that alone is a a bonding, loving, connecting experience for families. In addition, when you deep dive into a story, you begin to, because you deep dive into the, the life of characters, you create a, a whole world of imagination within your family that that extends well beyond that however many members are in your household so that all of a sudden your conversations are like we just finished the Harry Potter series so Harry and his friends are a part of so many of our conversations And they are extensions of our family right now because they are alive in our imaginations. And uh, so that, I think, also connects you socially and and to friends as well. Uh, As my son Zooms with friends and tries to connect with friends, he will talk about his favorite book characters and they will have book clubs, uh, unofficial book clubs, where they're talking about uh, plot lines and uh, exciting themes to them. So I think it does extend your your household considerably when you're deep diving into stories together. That's great. We also talked about uh, cooperative storytelling that that can be a wonderful game for Friday night pizza night. Uh, you can share, a, a person can start a sentence, there once was a tiny little black bear, and and have each person contribute to the story and do cooperative storytelling as a family, and it is surprisingly engaging and fun. That's great. Do you have any other uh, specific concrete ideas for ways to start cooperative storytelling? Yeah, um, there are, if if you have the story cubes, they're like little dice, you can roll the dice and, and that'll get you started on a story. Um, if you don't have story cubes, you can just like with charades, write down uh, people, places and things on piece, strips of paper and just choose out of a hat. And it kind of forces the person to think of how can I create a story around a red umbrella? And uh, and so you can begin to pass the story that way. It's, it's a whole mm-hmm. lot of fun. That is fun. We used to take hidden pictures in our household and try to make stories out of, you know, choose three or five of these hidden objects and make up a story around these hidden objects. These hidden oh, objects. that's a great idea. I love that. A fun way to extend a puzzle if you've got kids who would rather puzzle than... Uh, write stories or tell stories. It's a way to to do both. Yeah, I love that. We also have a an old fashioned typewriter, and so I will leave the typewriter on the table with a page in it with a sentence starter, and then as people come throughout the house, they add to that story as well. So it can be a written development of a story too. Well, that's fun. That's fun. So another way to spin stories, perhaps, is to start with what we're dreaming. And I know I have had some bizarro dreams during this time of COVID-19. And I've talked to other people who've also had some strange and funny dreams. But talking about our dreams is a way to open up conversation about some of our deepest thoughts and emotions as well. And it's a good way to to provide ourselves with some laughs. <laughs> so true. What have, what have you done with kids in this area? Well, I think it's fascinating to ask children about their dreaming and 
just pursue questions about their, their so they it gives them an opportunity to tell the story of what they dreamed and then if they depending on what they encountered maybe they encountered a tiger then the question becomes how did you feel about the tiger were you scared were you excited um uh, and understanding how they're feeling about various characters in their dream can give you insight into what they're processing through the night uh, and can also open up doors to talk about more difficult emotions. So dreams are another kind of imaginative entry point into discussing fears. You know, I wouldn't want parents to misunderstand. We're not trying to um, turn parents into social workers as well or her psychologists. Um, what we are trying to do is just help parents lean in and listen to their children so they know how their children are feeling. At the end of the day, the most important thing we can do for our kids is to make them feel heard and to acknowledge their feelings and to reassure them that they're going to be fine, offer them hope. Um, and I think all parents are more than capable of doing that. It's just a matter of being very intentional about it. I so agree. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be complicated, but but really listening to your child's feelings is 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 key. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for your time. As always, you've uh, given us lots to ponder, and it will be very helpful to uh, every adult who finds himself or herself talking to a child who is sequestered at home and who is like all of us trying to wrestle with the complicated feelings and emotions that come during this time. But reading is a good way to um, foster conversations and um, it's a great buffer against stress. And this is a great time to teach your kids to range for a book or listen to a story and discover all the value in that habit, in that practice. I so agree. I when we do our regular reading routine, I look forward to it and I know that it's going to be a time where I can calm down, where I can just sink in and enjoy the time and and treasure it with my child. So I I wish that for for listeners as well. Thank you. Uh, I believe you've prepared for us a list of places parents can go during this time to find some uh, helpful read aloud stories. Is that right? Yes, I I was so delighted at how many read alouds were on YouTube. And I focused on picture books and first chapter reader books that were that would deal with fears or worries. Um, one of them, the, the first one on the list, Ruby has a worry is so delightful and even my it's a, a picture book but my 12 year old read it and it's stuck in his head that this little girl starts out with this little yellow ball of worry and it grows and it grows and it kind of follows her around and she doesn't start to deal with it until all of a sudden she notices a boy and he's got a little blue ball of worry and all of a sudden she feels not so alone so I, I think the, these picture books can be really lovely and uh, they're great read alouds. Uh, so check them out. Thank you. We are going to post that list uh, on our, with our show notes. So thank you for your time putting that together for us. You're welcome. My, my pleasure. Hang in there, Jennifer. We'll talk to you again soon. Okay. Thanks, Christine. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. For show notes and information about other episodes in our podcast series, visit us at loveofreading.highlights.com. Hi, my name is Liam. I'm 10 years old. I like to read a lot of history books like World War II, and I like to read graphic novels. I want to find out more information. I want a next level of pictures in my mind or on the page.